or TIPS Masterclass webinar, What Are You Bringing Home? COVID-19, Evidence and Guidance for Frontline Workers to Protect Family Members from COVID-19 and Other Pathogens. The highly transmittable nature of this novel virus and the exposure risk associated with it are evolving daily. Understanding the most recent updates on government and regional, on COVID-19 rather, is essential and we implement re recommended processes and procedures from government and regional healthcare authorities. These recommendations will provide maximum and e efficacy against the virus while maintaining a safe environment for our staff, patients, and customers. The learning objectives for today are posted on the screen for your convenience. Participant lines have been muted. Unfortunately, continuing education or CE credits are not available for this event due to the limited time to obtain approval in this evolving COVID-19 situation. We will be hosting another webinar Tuesday, April 21st at noon. The webinar topic will be best practices to service facilities for COVID-19. My name is Dr. Katie Morales. I'm a professor of nursing at Berry College in Rome, Georgia. This presentation will last 50 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions and answers. Please type your questions in the webinar panel labeled Q&A. We will follow up with after the webinar to address any questions we are not able to answer during the webinar. By participating in this webinar, you acknowledge that the statements and information provided is for general guidance purposes only. The coronavirus situation is evolving and dynamic. You are advised to contact your local government and regional health authorities for specific instruction on all the topics mentioned in this webinar. This webinar is not to replace the guidance and direction of your local government and health authority. The webinar series is hosted by the Infection Prevention Strategy, or TIPS. TIPS is a not-for-profit organization existing to advance innovation, ideas, and processes which make a difference in global health. TIPS extends to over 30 countries and is the key strategic partner for many notable organizations, initiatives, and events. In the past few years, TIPS has contributed millions of dollars worth of scientific impact through various programs. You can learn about their successes in several ways. On their open access journal, www.infectioncontrol.tips, at conferences such as the HITS conference, www.hitsconsortium.org, through their masterclass events, www.masterseries.events or on their pad podcast series www.deepdive.tips. This webinar is sponsored by Curcia Medical, manufacturers of the NADCC fast dissolving effervescent tablets used for surface disinfection. These tablets are used across the U.S. and globally in hospitals and other facilities. They release hypochlorous acid when dissolved in water and are EPA approved for sporicidal for emerging pathogen viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 and biofilm. Without further delay, let me introduce today's speaker. Michael Gately is Managing Director of Medintech and is Vice President of Curcia, a global leader in hospital disinfection and industrial food hygiene. He holds a degree in social science from the University College of Dublin, an MBA from Smurfit University College, I'm sorry, Smurf at U University College of Dublin and postgraduate studies from Harvard. Michael is qualified trainer in hospital infection control. He has been an associate lecturer in organizational behavior with the National College of Ireland and the Institute of Public Administration. Visiting 25 countries annually, he worked in over 100 countries on infection control issues and behavioral change training. Some of the major post events Michael has worked include the Indonesian tsunami, SARS outbreak in Asia, earthquake and cholera outbreak in Haiti, and flooding in Pakistan and Vietnam. I'll turn this over to Michael. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Just letting the screen come up. Thank you all for uh, dedicating your time today, and thank you Dr. Katie and the TIPS organization for your kind invitation. So friends, this talk arises from a global literature review of academic publications relating to the risks that are faced by you, the healthcare workers, in bringing pathogens home to your family. And frankly, the results, they really have shocked us. Um, the talk itself, it deliberately focuses on what happens outside the hospital, more so than what happens in the hospital, although 
inevitably I'll speak about some things within the hospital. And the body of work here addresses pathogens generally as well as uh, coronavirus. So I'll start as I start all my talks uh, with this comment from the Director General of the World Health Organization. And here is what she said. The emergence and spread of drug-resistant pathogens has accelerated. More and more essential medicines are failing. The therapeutic arsenal is shrinking. The speed at which these drugs are being lost far outpaces the development of replacement drugs. In fact, the R&D pipeline for new antimicrobials, that's antibiotics for Europeans and Asians, uh, has practically run dry. So friends, all of you and all of us, we are the last line of defense Disinfection is the last line of defense. Today, so we're going to talk about what's the problem and how big is this problem? Who's at risk at home and why are they at risk? What's causing the transmissions? And we'll go through some guidance then. So let's start with what the problem is and how big this problem is. The frontline workers can be everybody. Um, obviously, nurses, doctors, uh, environmental services workers, but also the frontline grocery people. Uh, as the infection preventionist John LaRussell recently said, it's an environment of shared risk, and we're, we're all in this together. When we did this study, we got one enormous shock, and that was that significantly higher infections were observed amongst the family members of healthcare workers than the family members of patients. Now, take a moment for that to sink in. The people in the hospital with the diseases, their family members have less diseases than the family members of you or your family members. Um, came as quite a shock. And there was a number of different studies proved of this. Our second biggest shock, of course, was globally there are very few studies uh, which have which have um, relatively very few academic studies which have examined this issue of uh, healthcare workers bringing pathogens home to their to their families. Uh, and even less, which is, which is disappointing, even less studies were found on environmental services staff. For the Europeans and Asians listening, environmental staff are what we, what we would call currently the, the uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning type staff. Very few studies, and yet in one of the only ones we did manage to find, we found, of course, that, that these housekeeping staff had higher rates of tuberculosis, uh, higher than other people within the healthcare system. So, what we want to do today is to get you to ask yourself, what are you bringing home to your most vulnerable family members? What pathogens are you bringing them home? When are you most at risk to your vulnerable family members? So, the risk that you pose to them can vary. How are you bringing these uh, pathogens home? And then, when are your family members more vulnerable? So, four separate questions, and I hope to help you answer them before the end of uh, this conversation today. So, healthcare workers are dying from what they pick up in the hospitals. Um, if I take as a, as a parallel example, 2,300 of our brave NYPD officers have tested positive for coronavirus. And they don't, on a daily basis, uh, interact in quite the, the same way with people who already have coronavirus in intensive areas. So, Imagine if that's the level of infection amongst the officers, what it could be amongst our, uh, our healthcare staff. Um, you, healthcare worker, you can act as a reservoir for transmitting the infections to your families without being sick yourself. So you could be out jogging, you could be doing uh, the things you normally do, feeling perfectly healthy, and yes, you're bringing the diseases to your family members. And of course, these infections will hit immunocompromised people and you might act as a reservoir. I remember well working during the SARS outbreak how one in five of the uh, people affected were actually healthcare workers. Um, healthcare workers, especially those taking care of high risk patients, pose a heightened risk of transmitting the pathogens. And again, another study by Lou et al, they showed that there were higher rates of nasal carriage of pathogens uh, amongst healthcare workers' families than the families of patients. And then, again, a different study, recent studies have identified how healthcare uh, the household members are more likely to carry MRSA than the general population. So the facts are there, folks. The facts are stark. We have to protect our families. Here's an interesting case study by Alan et al. This nurse had recurring uh, chest infections, MRSA, and she'd been given antibiotic treatment. 
the infection was also found at separate and different times amongst her son and her husband. And eventually, the suspected mode of transmission were their toothbrushes, where they were touching uh, each other. But MRSA was found uh, amongst all the soft furnishings in the house, etc. So it's very difficult to get out of the home when it gets into the home. And it can ping pong back and forth. And this is where we want to break this chain of infection. This is an important slide, friends. It's a long list of, or it's a list of the family members who have heightened vulnerability. Elderly people to start with, and we all know what's happening right at this time. But even if we don't talk about coronavirus right now, we know that C. diff spores affect elderly people more so than, than, than the young, and particularly uh, elderly females. So if you're looking after a C. diff risk patient, then you are more uh, risky to your family, and if you have an elderly parent, uh, they are more at risk. Babies, of course, particularly weanling babies, have less immunity and they're vulnerable. People who are ill or recovering from illness, they're more vulnerable. Taking antacid tablets, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the next, I'm sure you'll all join me in saying, we should say it together, please avoid taking antimicrobials, antibiotics. Um, they're over-prescribed and uh, it's something that we, we all want to encourage all our families to avoid. But they reduce they can reduce immunity. People with AIDS are, have more vulnerability. People undergoing treatments such as cancer or transplant. People on dialysis. Simple, simple things like asthma. Or even more simple, people with open cuts in the home. Simple acne, cold sores, blisters. These are all our family members who are, have a heightened vulnerability. So part of what you do is needs to help protect them during these vulnerable periods. The elderly, as I mentioned, um, this study here of found, not to our surprise, that the heightened level of respiratory illness amongst the elderly. But shockingly in this study, the authors identified 37 different pathogens associated with 206 outbreaks in the long-term care facility. But the big shock, of course, was that the healthcare workers were infected in more than 50% of these cases. Now, remember, in the long-term care facilities, you don't quite have the same level of infection risk. And yet, here, half of the healthcare workers were infected and were likely to bring it back to their family. So it just evidences how we need to be so careful. The acid and suppressants, plenty of well-known brands there, they can reduce your immunity. Simple thing like that. So less is more when it comes to taking any uh, prescribed or unprescribed uh, medicines. Um, obviously, children with any underlying conditions can be more vulnerable. Here, 28.6, almost a third of children with cerebral palsy will uh, contract some form of respiratory tract infection when they're exposed to healthcare-associated infections. So, and obviously, during this corona crisis, we need to be particularly careful. If you have a child who needs care and needs to come at your bed, to your bed in the nighttime, uh, consider sleep. I know it sounds funny, but it's, it, it actually works. Consider sleeping head to toe with them. And the same goes for your partner if they're at risk uh, also. Pregnant ladies, uh, the, uh, the, the, the new infant uh, showed that the, this study showed that neonatal infections in the first week of life is associated with maternal infections. So basically the mother catching the, the uh, particular pathogens affects the, the, the newborn. Okay. Let's start looking so at uh, what's causing the transmissions. And here's something we rarely talk about, but we should. Let's start with it ourselves and the potential for clinical burnout. You're coming off a late shift. You're coming off a long week. You're tired. We can drop our guard. Uh, we just want to get home, and um, we can drop our guard in terms of, uh, of our infection control procedures for ourselves. But we need to have heightened awareness these days. I really love the comment by uh, Jordan Peterson when he talked about people. He said, look, you need to treat yourself like someone who you have responsibility to take care of. Every day in the hospital, you're almost genetically programmed to care for and help people. But you can forget about yourself in all of this. So be, care be careful for yourself and, as, as he said, treat yourself like someone whom you have responsibility to take care of. And then that transfers on into educating your families because when you're taking care of yourself, 
you can also then uh, be a role model for your families. Okay, now before we get into uh, what we're going to do at home, just a few tips for you that uh, people have found important over the, over the years. A couple of points. Uh, a moist hand, if you wash your hands well, but a moist hand and don't dry them properly, you pick up seven times more germs than a, than a, a dry hand. So not only is the proper procedure uh, to wash your hands important, but also proper drying is important. Um, movable bed tables all over the world I see patients pulling the table by putting their hand underneath and thumb on top and pulling the table towards them and yet I very very rarely see the underneath of the table being disinfected so in your role as infection preventionist if you have a seat on the uh, infection control committee try and encourage that the training be given to disinfect under the table themselves the next point uh, also comes from quite a shocking study in this study, it was found that 93%, this was uh, Hugh et al. and previously uh, Professor Vickery, 93% of all uh, intensive care units and or surfaces have a biofilm growing on it. That's a, uh, a biofilm on the operating tables, a biofilm throughout the uh, entire area. And shockingly, 50% of them have multi-drug resistant organisms living in it. So again, for your seat on your infection control committee, you need to be using a EPA approved product approved to kill the biofilms, wet surface biofilms that live uh, around, uh, around any kind of sinks or showers, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to be addressing these biofilms. And then finally, as I've already mentioned there, higher risk patients, you need to take more risk and more care of yourself. So here's an admission. I've been doing these training programs for 18 years, and for 17 of those years, I've been saying to people, look, um, floors aren't so important, no, no big worry, and I was wrong. Recently, Professor Donsky did a study where he took, and he and his researchers, took one square meter of um, the uh, critical care area and inoculated it with a non-pathogenic indicator germ. Three days later, that germ was found on every single surface in the ICU. And that was despite the unit having a good uh, uh, procedure and, uh, and, uh, for, for disinfection. So imagine, only one square meter, not the whole floor, just one square meter turned up on every surface. Here now, in this study, direct from Wuhan, carried out by the military medicine, um, they found the virus was most, this is the coronavirus, was most heavily concentrated on the floors, probably caused by, by gravity in the droplets. And half of the samples of the soles of, of the shoes of medical staff tested positive for, for the virus. So, as I said, I was wrong. Floors are dangerous. Floors need to be disinfected, particularly during this crisis. And uh, you need to use a proper disinfectant, so not a cleaner, not a detergent. So again, please try and influence your infection control committees. I want to give you just a quick insight into what I mean by driving defensively. Uh, for one particular study, I embedded myself in a intensive care unit, post-operative area, uh, for 48 hours. Basically, for as long as I could stay awake in the chair, I sat and watched for this study. And there were the usual uh, breaches of protocol caused by, you know, tired people, people not being trained properly, and of course, the usual, the, the, the more qualified people are, the less they seem to need to think they need to do the proper disinfection. But in this study, uh, when the um, surgical staff had left their staff canteen, I went down for dinner. And I'll give you all one guess, and just one guess, as to where all the chairs were. And you've got it. Every single chair was up on the table so that the uh, staff, uh, the cleaning staff, could clean the floor. Now, you all know that the next day, all of the medical teams that are in there will pick up whatever was on the floor on their hands and, and sleeves and so on. So, my point is that when we're taught how to drive, we're taught to drive defensively. It means we watch out for people doing things to us. We watch out for cars coming out from places that they shouldn't and so on. The same goes for the hospital environment and how you protect your family. You have to assume the chairs are on the table. Therefore, you have to uh, disinfect yourself properly uh, when you're returning home.
And here is the study that proves exactly what, what, what I observed. 31% of the uniforms uh, tested positive for one or more uh, pathogenic organisms. Here, a study, this is very sad actually. Uh, in this particular study, the, um, between 25 and 50% of physicians' coats were found to harbor Staphylococcus aureus and even the neckties were, were seen. Um, I, I'm reminded a very sad situation. I was doing a talk, I won't say the country, but I was doing a talk in a Central American country where I was on the slide similar to this and uh, saying how we need to protect our, 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 our family from the uniforms. And sitting in the audience was a physician who had recently been going home to breastfeed her infant son um, and regrettably the son died, the little child died from something that picked up off her whites, off her uniform. So our uniforms are contaminated, there's no doubt about it, so we need at this time and at all times to uh, take greater care. Um, and now with washing machines running lower temperature cycles, what you get is a germ stew in some of the sumps of these of these washing machines. We took apart a washing machine and we found biofilm growing on the back of the rotary drum. Um, so uh, we'll talk about uh, a little later some things you can do to, to help um, uh, mitigate that. You all know we were going to get there, folks. You all know we were going to talk about mobile phones or cell phones. So let's let's go through this. This study found that between 50 and 65 percent of healthcare uh, workers use their phones during physical contact, put them down on the surfaces, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that most people just don't regularly clean them. Half of all the phone samples that were sampled had some microbial growth in them. The majority of us knew, 90 percent of us never cleaned. So we know that there are potential pathogenic bacteria on them, uh, but we're not cleaning them. Friends, we put these beside our face, we put them beside our mouth, we hold them with our hands, we have to now treat them like a danger zone. We love our phones, they're part of our body, uh, they're our outlet for, for uh, relaxation, uh, perhaps at the end of a busy day, the minute we get out of the hospital, we're, we're, we're putting them up to our face again, but we have to treat them as a danger zone. Now, here, I'll just read you through this, because I think it's gonna be useful to you. Um, Occupational hand dermatitis likely causes increased rates of nosocomial infection. So this is from the pathogens entering through the cracks in, in your hands and also from pathogens living there and being transferred to the home. So generally speaking, uh, for Clostridium difficile, you should wash your hands in cool water with soap, not, uh, not alcohol. You rinse your, well, your hands well before putting on gloves, as any of the soap residual can increase the irritation. And ideally, moisturize your hands after you've used the soap. Um, outside of that, um, you can use, obviously, uh, alcohol for, for this COVID crisis, uh, but ideally encourage your hospital to be using alcohols that have, don't have colors and don't have scents in them, because these can cause irritation. It's the residual on your hands that can cause irritations. Uh, facial hair is a small issue. It's, I, I don't want to suggest it's a huge issue, but uh, if you have a beard, then consider a proper uh, wash before, before going home because it, they do harbor an increased amount of uh, bacteria. Okay, so let's get into some of the guidance now, friends. Um, achieving behavioral change can be a difficult thing, and it needs to be done uh, in a gentle way. So be gentle with yourself, don't consider this a, 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 a task. It's not an extra regime to impose on your family. You, you really need to consider it like part of the gentle process that eases into family life and becomes part of the loving process of the family. So, for example, if you have children, uh, you can make a game of it that uh, any time somebody uh, touches the T-zone, they, they lose a penny and, uh, uh, and uh, so on and so on. Or even with your, with your partner or family members, they lose a dollar, however you want to play it. But uh, make it something that's part of, part of, the, uh, part of, your, part of you all rather than uh, something you're trying to impose on them. And what should our homes be like? This is a spectrum. On the left-hand side is one extreme, on the right side is another extreme. Tropical entropy is where 
very often suffered by children, where the environment and the amount of pathogens that are being challenged by an organic matter that are being challenged by on a daily basis means they can't even uh, take in proper um, inoculation orally because it just shoots straight through their body so that they, they can't absorb nutrients properly, such as the level of dirt and the constant challenge to the system. On the right hand side, um, there are many situations or studies of Japan where children don't acquire the correct immunity uh, because their homes are not quite sterile but so highly disinfected. My point is that as a healthcare worker, you shouldn't be in the middle of this spectrum, but you should certainly be to the right of the, of the middle line. Uh, and depending on your risk level and your daily variety in the, in the risk uh, that you're undergoing in work, you can consider increasing the disinfection in your home. But please, 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 everybody, uh, have your uh, vaccinations up to date. Um, and don't forget the boosters. Um, and the same goes for your family members. Okay. Now, this is just a simple little algorithm um, for you to consider for elderly people in the home or other immune, immunocompromised people. Um, if, if possible, how can you separate yourself from them in the home? If you can, great. Stay separate in the home. If you can't separate yourself during this crisis period, then can they stay elsewhere or can you stay elsewhere? All around the world, folks, all around the world, I find that it's the healthcare member of the siblings that ends up looking after mom or looking after dad. Um, but in this occasion, now is the time to plea that they, they shouldn't be in your home. So where are the germs in your home? Well, in this particular study in 2008, very surprisingly, the germs were found everywhere except where we potentially thought they would be. Um, the kitchen chopping board and the child's potty, there was none there, but they were everywhere else in the home. If you see on the bottom right-hand side of the screen these, these um, sponge scrubbers, every time my wife's back is turned, I bin these scrubbers. Uh, they, they are a bug stew, a wonderful moist breeding ground for germs, particularly when they're stored in the sink. Uh, and not let dry out. So um, use them sparingly. You only use them where necessary and be sure and disinfect them. And, and of course, in the follow-up study to this particular one, uh, the highest bacteria found in the wet area where you get particular loads of biofilm growth, but also all the handles. Things to watch out for, of course, are the, um, the keyboards, the mouse, the phone, and always, always the remote control. The remote control seems to be uh, regularly forgotten as an uh, item that should be disinfected, but all the family members tend to touch it. So let's go in to have a look at some of the tips for not bringing home infections. Um, can you have a separate pair of shoes for work? Maybe even leaving them in the car and so, and, and so on. If so, it's certainly worth doing and disinfect the shoes weekly as well. Uh, if you have a watch, um, can you disinfect this particular watch uh, or don't wear a watch? Pens, I remind you of that study, um, study on biofilm in the, in the OR. Even on the little paper clips, a biofilm was growing. So work pens should stay in work. And of, obviously, you can change out of your scrubs before going home into a safe pair of clothes or change them out as you enter your home. Your car, don't forget the inside of your car. This can be a, a transmitter of pathogens because your, your kids or your partners or so on can be traveling with you the next day, that day, so on. So you can do a disinfection procedure for your car as well. And as I mentioned earlier, clean and disinfect. And note I said that clean and disinfect the mobile phones before going home. Um, general advice, you all know this, but this is advice to be given to your family too. And I include hair in it. So hair, nose, eyes, mouth, uh, this is a T-zone. We've just got to keep training ourselves not to touch it. Um, we have to improve our home disinfection and not sanitization. So sanitization does not kill sufficient pathogens uh, to make a surface safe for healthy people. We need to improve uh, the disinfection of it, and you can only do that with some EPA-approved uh, disinfectant. And then have regular checkups uh, to see if you have a particular pathogen you might be carrying inadvertently. 
before returning home, we mentioned changing your clothes, washing your hands to your elbows. If you wear civvies to work, uh, avoid long sleeves if possible. And finally, for those traveling home, not everybody's going in cars. Some people will be on, on trains and you name it. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I say go with the mask. I know there's opinion is divided on it, but a disposable mask, if you can, I would wear it. Okay, so on arrival home, uh, take off your shoes and leave them at the door. Leave your clothes in a tied plastic bag or straight into the laundry. Always with any anything related to, to, to uh, where you work. Uh, you don't scrunch down the bag and end up getting a plume of, of air from the bag into your face. You gooseneck swing it and tie it so, so that you don't pull pathogens into your face. Uh, if you've done some shopping, consider leaving everything except the perishables at the door uh, in case there are some, uh, some virus on it uh, from the actual uh, shop itself. Um, when you're washing your hands, apart from what you will do at the front door, always, and this is important for your family members too, always wash your hands in the bathroom, never in the kitchen sink. If you, dis if you wash your hands in the kitchen sink, what you're doing is populating the biofilm that grows in the, in the uh, drain itself with new pathogens from the hospital. You certainly don't want to do that. So the bathroom is where we wash our hands. Um, when you arrive home, shower if possible, and then disinfect the shower floor. Um, the shower floor does accumulate uh, quite, a, quite a lot of, of pathogens. If you have a mat outside your, um, your shower, seriously consider getting rid of that mat. They are home. That's they are home for pathogens, uh, and use just a laundrable towel, and, a towel instead of a mat. Um, with uh, with your family members, when you arrive home, obviously you can do a quick observation to see that none of them have have uh, any symptoms. And as as ever, when we arrive home, folks, toilet paper is very porous, so always double it over, and then proper hand hygiene afterwards. Um, Thanks a lot to Josh Merson here for this photograph. This is a current procedure that he's doing himself. He has an 18-month-old son who has asthma. So uh, Josh, when he arrives home, goes through a full procedure of taking off everything. Um, and then on entering the home, and here's a really great idea for you. Have set up a, a little front door or back door or garage disinfection station. This means that you don't have to wander through your home looking for where did I leave the hand disinfectant, where did I leave the shoe disinfectant, where should I put my clothes. Everything is ready. And this is a great reminder for your family members as well uh, that when they come in, wow, okay, I'll just go through this and, uh, and we, we've done a good job. So within this system here, there's alcohol to disinfect phones, there's hand sanitizers, there's paper towels to wipe things down, there's a garbage bin to get rid of the little towels. Um, and uh, if you don't do this, well, you can spread pathogens throughout the house on your way to do proper disinfection. So if you can, if you have a garage, you can undress in the garage and ideally, as I said, go through a full shower. And you all know how to wash your hands properly. For our family within the home, educate your family members. Educate them to self-protection and to the prevention. Educate them to the symptoms alert. Educate them to proper hand washing. Educate them to the don't touch the T-zone. And simple things as, as we learn, like your toothbrush. When you use a toothbrush that is infected, you're effectively, the little bristles on the toothbrush are injecting directly under your gums and perhaps into your bloodstream pathogens that are on that brush. So let the toothbrushes dry out and keep them well away from uh, other toothbrushes and well away, well away from your toilet. And then encourage your, your family members to have uh, regular checkups. Some other thoughts for you folks. I've stopped wearing false nails myself, but uh, please don't wear false nails. They, they, uh, to work, I mean. They, they really can accumulate, and it's been proven that they accumulate substantial amounts of pathogens. If you are ill, stay at home. You have become one of the vulnerable. Um, so please stay at home and mind yourself. And if family members feel unwell, we have to listen these days. As healthcare workers, we, we can be a bit jaundiced about man flu or things like this. But if there is any complaint being made, let's listen a little more tightly these days. So disinfection home procedure, biofilms, 
are in the home just as they're in the uh, ICU as per that study. So you need to use a disinfectant EPA approved that, that kills these. Uh, ideally, you should use a high level broad spectrum disinfectant. And what I mean by broad spectrum is that it kills bacteria, microbacteria, fungi, spores, viruses and biofilm. If your disinfectant doesn't kill all these things, then what's left behind survives, multiplies and mutates. Uh, so you're looking for something that can help kill all of these things. Um, if you use cloths in your kitchen and you wash them, then maybe give them a microwave after the washing process to, to really uh, kill any of the pathogens on them. Never store these cloths uh, beside the sink because biofilms grow at about an inch per day from the drain holes in the sink. Therefore, sink a drain hole disinfection is also a good idea. So before you go to bed, because this will mean the, the disinfectant will dwell overnight, you can put it in, in a circular motion, you can put a, a disinfectant that's effective against biofilm down the drain. Um, coronavirus, obviously, but the studies are shown, can survive for up to 72 hours. So this is why you want to use a disinfectant regularly. Uh, we talked about the clothes washer, how these low temperature washes are, can result in a breeding ground for pathogens and they've been swapped between clothes. Um, so ideally run a boil wash every week um, and then let some disinfectant dwell in the sump. For soft furnishings, this is a tough one, folks. Uh, steam seems to be the best way to disinfect those and I've currently nothing better to offer you than that. Um, and as I said, disinfect your sinks at least every week. Now let's just look at where the frequent touch surface. So we don't all have t all the time in the world to disinfect everything in the home. Forget about it. We're not going to be able to do it. We don't have the time to do it. Um, so what are the things in particular that we should consider? So our car itself and our car keys, uh, the doorknobs, the table surfaces. These are the things that are, now it's not an exhaustive list, I'm sure you can add to it, but these are the things that are most frequently touched in your home. The backs of your dining chairs, um, the kitchen counters, the handles of the coffee machine, the kettle, the fridge door, uh, the microwave door handle, light switches, I mentioned already the TV remote control, then things, game controllers and laptops and the mice, never forget the mice, um, toys, uh, bathroom tops, bathroom counters, the faucet and faucet knobs, the shower door. Uh, if you have a shower curtain, the technique to disinfect the shower curtain is to put a, a, a disinfectant cloth in both hands, a disposable paper, and run it hand to hand like a silent clap down along the side of the, the leading edge of the curtain itself. Um, for your toilets, folks, we all obsess about disinfecting the seat when it's the handle that's the most infected item. So more so than the seat itself, disinfect the handle. And then empty out your trash on a daily basis. It can be a breeding ground, so get it out of the house much more regularly than we normally did. And again, if you're pulling out a bag of trash, be careful that you don't end up with a plume of air coming up into your face. You want to do a gooseneck twirl of it, and then you can tie a knot in it. Um, and as ever, after you've finished cleaning, you've got to clean yourself, clean and disinfect yourself. Um, some other small tips, don't use the same cloth in the kitchen and the bathroom and uh, disinfect a mop after use and let it dry out completely. Um, you mop from the floor into the bucket, so some people think they're doing a good job if they use all, the, all of the liquid contents from the bucket. You're, be careful that at least 50% of the, of the liquid contents should remain in the bucket, because if you use it all, all you've done is lifted the dirt from the floor and then put it back on the floor. Next point, ladies, you were right all along. We should keep the toilet seat down because every time a toilet is flushed, there is a six foot plume, airy plume of pathogens that rises from the toilet. And this is what's getting onto the toothbrush. So for your toothbrush, you can let them dry out, as I mentioned earlier, and keep them far away from the toilets. Cell phone disinfection, we said we'd get her. Um, so use maybe some water waterproof or water resistant case, something non-porous. Um, and perhaps like a Ziploc bag that you can dispose of uh, so that you can do proper disinfection of it. Zip, the, the disposable bag is, is quite a good idea. 
um, clean and then disinfected the device because there's lots of oil from our hands and other organic matter on it and you can't properly disinfect something if it's not cleaned properly. And then a really good idea is set yourself a little rem alarm, perhaps just before you leave your place of work, to remind you to uh, carry out that disinfection procedure because you know you're going to be putting it beside your mouth within minutes of leaving your, your facility. Um, here is a request for you folks. Our, our friends in, in the environmental services, there's a big turnover of staff there. So please apply to your uh, infection control committee, very regular training of these EVS per people to help them protect their staff, their family members. Uh, and that's something I'd, I'd, I'd love if you could take on to encourage. Okay, so folks, you're burning the candle at both ends. You're absolutely amazing and amazing at this time, but you're not magic and we really need you to stay healthy. So please do. Thank you and with much love from everybody at Curcia. And remember, you know, there is light. There really is light at the end of this corona tunnel. And right now, for many, many people, you, you are that light. Stay safe. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, for that excellent and very informative presentation. We have several questions, so let's get started. Our first one, I'll go back to my screen where I can see it, mentioned a study that was published last Friday by the CDC, which showed the shoe soles of the healthcare workers in the hospital had 50% positive rate of COVID infection on them and furthermore swab the floors in the pharmacy in that hospital, which is restricted, of course, no patients go there. And the pharmacy had 100% positive rates of COVID-19. So the question is, what is your suggesting on stopping the spread of shoeborne pathogens in the hospital, as well as advice to healthcare workers for the shoeborne pathogens they may be bringing home from the hospital? Okay, well, uh, it's a it's a critical area, and you know I feel humble because I miss uh, well with through lack of knowledge uh, misled people for 17 years. I did not realize or understand the importance of floors. So and it's a new learning, and thanks to Professor Donsky on it. Now that we know, um, we need to disinfect hospital floors. Now that we know, you please apply to your uh, infection control committee to consider either some form of foot dip with a dry process afterwards or some kind of uh, wet walkthrough, a moist um, a disinfectant uh, uh, cloth walkthrough. This is, this is the only way we're going to get on top of this, is disinfecting the floor so no longer detergent cleaning. Most hospitals that I, that I know of had been just using a detergent cleaning for the floor. We need to move to a disinfectant for the floor. It doesn't have to be uh, the, the high PPMs used in the, in the critical care areas, but it needs to certainly be effective against uh, a, a broad spectrum of pathogens. So I, I maintain the quaternary pneumonia compounds, quats, is no longer enough. Um, you need a disinfectant EPA approved to kill all of the emerging pathogens and a broader range. I think it's interesting Thank that you were talking about the effect of the droplets on the floor. I think we have focused so much on the airborne and the N95s, we have forgotten that that aspect of the droplet um, impact. You know, that's very interesting. Our next question, question is from a former presenter, Dr. Reddy. Uh, said, great presentation. How would you encourage building the culture of cleaning or disinfection in the public without the germaphobe mentality? Wow. Um, well, you know, here's an interesting thing, folks. The, we, we know generally in the world what the germs are. We know generally in the world the chemicals that will kill those germs. So we have the problem and we have the solution. The difficulty definitely lies in the middle, and that middle is the behavioral change. Um, so obviously, for the broad population that, that was mentioned in the question, we need broad uh, campaigns of, of, uh, of uh, knowledge and education. This is the time to do it. We will never get a time again like this to, to do it. So now is the time. And then each one of us on, on the call here 
we have a we have responsibility within our family to to educate them um but it it never works when we try to uh, insist and push. We we want them to be part of the change. We want your family members to really feel part of it. So it's a it's a it's a family wide issue. But we need to bring them along as a, hey, how do we all mind ourselves from this? As opposed to mom or dad is insisting I do this, or my partner is insisting I do this. No, it, behavioural change only works with uh, with the uh, with the consent. And the um, excitement of the of the person you're you're trying to influence. Michael, I really appreciate that part of your presentation. When I did my dissertation, I I used the health belief model for my um, framework, and that's what I'm hearing you say. Human behavior is such a complicated um, beha um, concept, and I I really mm -hmm. appreciate that you're bringing all those factors into it. <clears throat> Our next question was, do you feel that over disinfecting can increase opportunity for opportunistic bacteria and viruses? Natural flora helps combat some bacteria and viruses. And this person said the slide you provided showing to the Japan model and topical etymology was a perfect example. Yeah, okay, so I don't want to stray too far outside my area of expertise here, and I, we have, uh, I have a molecular microbiologist uh, PhD sitting not too far away from me at the moment, so I don't want to trample on, on their ground. Um, there is, in life, of course, there is such a thing as too much, and, and we see it in Japan. Uh, interestingly, there are studies that show that families with pets, dogs in particular, that the children have less, uh, less diseases and are more robust than families without. So there is certainly, uh, there is certainly a thing called, that is, there is certainly too much that we can go to. Um, we are at this moment in a dangerous situation. So at this moment, it's difficult to err on the side of too little. Uh, so I would be increasing that spectrum. And as I was pointing out in that slide, you can move yourself up and down along the spectrum depending on whether you're nursing people who are at increased, or at increased risk or whether you have family members who are increased vulnerability. So uh, the part that your, 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 your questioner is correct. There is such a thing as too much for sure, um, but we are in a heightened state at this time. Okay. Um, here's a question. I, I'm going to give my thoughts and I'm going to shoot it over to you because I don't know if you'll, well, let's just hear it. The hospital I work at, some workers wear shoe covers in the OR department. How often and when should they change the shoe covers? So I would say that the shoe cover, if you're wearing it from room to room, you're protecting your shoes and not the surfaces. So I would say change it every time you enter a new area that you're trying to protect. What are your thoughts on that, Michael? Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. You know, I call it the gloves fallacy that uh, um, for a lot of people, they consider that when they've put on a pair of gloves that they are more protected, uh, but they can equally be putting the glove to their T-zone or wearing it to multiple different places and not performing enough hand hygiene and changing out the gloves. So uh, absolutely, you need to segregate where you are and if you have worn something into a risk area uh, or if you're going from zone to zone, you need to be changing it. And, and it certainly comes from, we've heard now three studies today, that new one I hadn't heard from the CDC, the one from Wuhan and the previous one, that floors are dangerous. So they're a heightened, uh, they're a heightened risk. I had just gotten that question from um, graduates of mine who are now working and about shoes and they were trying to find products to clean their shoes, but of course the stores are out of everything right now. Um, I was gonna comment, I really appreciated your algorithm about should the family member be at home. So I shared with you before the webinar started that I'm a nurse and I'm just recently returned to the hospital to help them. My husband's a hospital pharmacist and our son with asthma, who's a, a senior in college, he's not a young child lives with us and we actually asked him if he was comfortable staying in the house with us since we could be bringing it home and gave him the opportunity to go stay somewhere else if he um, felt at high risk here. I know before the webinar started we also discussed a little bit about scrub etiquette and 
uh, you know, not wearing your scrubs out in public if you leave the hospital and then run by Kroger or, or the grocery store on your way home that you could possibly be taking um, pathogens out into the environment. Do you have any comments further on that? Yeah, I mean, if, if, there, if there are scrubs, if they're your own scrubs and you need to bring them home, I would certainly be considering um, bring, putting them into a tied plastic bag and bringing them home because we saw 31% of all scrubs examined had pathogens on them. So they are a risk item. Um, and who knows, you know, amongst the public now, there are some who will appreciate and applaud you as a frontline worker in your scrubs, but there are others who will, who will be somewhat threatened by the fact that the scrubs could have pathogens on them. So I, I would recommend that you, uh, that you uh, don't wear them uh, uh, publicly if possible. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that here with um, nurses either being hailed as heroes and people applauding them. And then in Europe, there is a nurse who was actually evicted from her apartment because they felt like she was potentially exposing everybody in the apartment complex. So it's wow. kind of interesting. I did have one point of clarification, so I'm sorry. Um, you were talking about taking a shower and not using a, a mask. Are you talking about like a loofah, the little um, porous thing you get with shower gel? Uh, is that what a mask is? No. Um, what I meant is, on the, as you step out of the out of the shower, people often have these lovely, colourful uh, mats um, and uh, to absorb water from the from the body just outside the shower. And these mats, these shower mats have been studied and are found to be really replete with, with pathogens. Um, so what we need is something that is being replaced very regularly and, and laundered properly. So these mats are dangerous in the hospital and at home um, and uh, should be considered a risk item. Okay. Uh, here's a question that says, how long can the virus stay on our scrubs? She's thinking we should keep it in a bag and leave it there until the virus dies. And then would you be bringing it in to wash less than the risk of transmission? So is that viable? So I think the question is, um, I know some people here, let me just see if this is what she's asking. Like that if you left the clothes in a paper bag for three days, could the virus potentially die before you wash it? I think that's the question. Yeah. So, um, the, the studies on the particular virus are increasing all the time. Um, initially, we thought it died much more quickly. Um, and if died is even the right word, but I, 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 people will understand what I mean. Um, so if you, if you have the luxury of having a number of different scrubs or, or clothes that, that you can rotate, uh, then certainly, by all means, uh, as long as the bag isn't going to be interfered with by children or, or there aren't holes in the bag, you could consider leaving it for a longer time because it certainly will uh, assist you and then you won't transfer the, the, the pathogen to your, to your um, uh, washing machine. Okay. I was going to ask, you mentioned leaving um, non-perishable groceries for 24 hours if possible, but is, where did the number 24 come from? Why not three days if possible? What was your thought on 24 hours? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an arbitrary figure. We, we don't actually have uh, any study that we could currently find other than what we're finding on, on surface items like plastics and on surface items like stainless steel. So um, at this moment in time, our best, our best, uh, our best um, estimation of the mix, the basket of different items in it, we found that 24 hours was reasonably sufficient for uh, for a reduction in the in the pathogen but we were open to correction on that i have to say it could be longer could be better in this instance okay uh, what about bringing food home from the grocery store like should we be washing it cleaning it like baking using baking soda what are your thoughts on that yeah i mean i'm happy to see that most stores now have improved their um, sanitation methods. Uh, they're wrapping items in in cling film, but before it was wrapped, it might have been uh, it might have been affected. So um, look, we're we're in this uh, situation right now. So the more uh, more infection control procedures you run run, the better. 
Okay. I also uh, really appreciate with, with, it. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, with the caution, folks, that you know we we have to live, and at the end of the day, we we can't exhaust ourselves with this. So the important thing is that you're healthy and that your mind is in a good place and that you're able to go to work refreshed the next day. So our home is our castle and it shouldn't be a threat to us. So everything I say, I'm saying we need to do this in a gentle way, in a way that doesn't uh, cause us cause the home to be anything that we're threatened with. Uh, so do it in such a way that, that is comfortable to you, uh, but not more than that because we, we need our rest. That's very good words of wisdom. I was just going to say, I really appreciated your um, list, although you said it wasn't exhaustive, of things to clean at home. So we know that it's typically the high touch surfaces. Would you also, well, how would you recommend us cleaning our floors at home since we know the floors in the hospital, like what products are available to us in the public for cleaning at home? Um, well, perhaps you can apply to your uh, your facility if they, they, they might spare you some disinfectant. Who knows? Uh, it might be worth talking to your facility about it. Uh, but look, there's a, there's quite a range of uh, EPA approved uh, disinfectants. Um, so you want you want you want something that's not just a sanitizer. So when you see kills 99.9 percent .9 of bacteria, be suspicious because that's not enough really for disinfection. And it doesn't mention viruses and doesn't mention uh, other things. So um, I, I'm deliberately sort of giving you a general uh, answer to this because there are quite a number of options that, that you can do. That's for all hard surfaces, all soft plastics, glass, countertops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and uh, for your for your wet areas, uh, you you do need to be using a, a, something that's effective against biofilm. However, for as I mentioned, for your soft surfaces, your carpets inside your door, uh, perhaps if you have a soft couch, um, it seems to me so far that that, uh, that steam cleaning is is, uh, is is very effective. Okay, I was going to ask you another question. Uh, as far as cleaning our showers, so I had not really thought about cleaning the surface, the floor of the shower. Uh, would chlorine be a good option for that? Yes, indeed. Um, it's certainly one of the best options. Um, and uh, you can let the, the, the chlorine dwell in the drain. Uh, ideally, even let it dwell overnight to prevent any biofilm growth down there. So the floors of showers are, are a risk area. There's high levels of, of pathogens on those floors. Um, so they do need to be disinfected. And remember, you're walking very often from your shower uh, and maybe getting into bed uh, shortly afterwards. So this is how you can transfer germs that were somewhere on your body onto the shower floor, onto your feet, and then into your bed. Um, so yes, I, I would certainly disinfect floors and chlorine um, is, is a good broad spectrum disinfectant. Oh, wow, that's an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. I was going to point out, um, you mentioned using moisturizer for our hands to prevent the dermatitis, which is excellent, but I was just going to caution anybody listening to make sure that your moisturizer is compatible with the gloves that your facility uses, that not all moisturizers are compatible with all cleaning the soap and the gloves that we use. So just make sure you run that through your infection prevention team at the hospital as well. Uh, Michael, people, most of uh, the questions are actually people just saying what an excellent job you did and how much they appreciate it. So uh, it's interesting. We're not getting as many questions as uh, appreciation and comments oh, wow. about how well, excellent this is and that everybody, not just healthcare workers, should watch this. Somebody said the people in the grocery stores need to watch it. So are you seeing that in Ireland as well. We're seeing the public is using PPE here, but they're using it so incorrectly. Like they either have their mask under their chin or just, you know, with their nose exposed or they're wearing gloves and just never changing them and touching everything with their gloves. Yes, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, error in innocence going on. You see people driving their cars with gloves and, and traveling around with it. Um, not so many, not so many masks being being used in Ireland. Um, I I'm literally just travelling from work 
to home and back again. I'm not I'm not going anywhere else. And uh, our next step, if things uh, if things get worse, is we're going into a lock in as opposed to a lockout. So from where where we work, we'd be locking ourselves in here and only leaving on on a weekly basis. So it really depends on on what sort of spike we see. Oh wow. Yeah, we're preparing for a surge here. So I mentioned I went back to work and we're creating a 200 bed hospital in a parking deck, getting ready for the surge they're predict predicting. Dr. Rode wow. uh, wrote a very good comment and this is very true. He's just reminding people to be careful not to mix your cleaners in the shower, which is a closed area because of the dangerous gases which could emerge. And it's interesting very good point. that Dr. Rode because I just read where people were um, saying quit telling people to disinfect their mask in the microwave and that there's been some house fires because people forget there's a little piece of metal in the mask and they, they're microwaving their mask. So I think we do need yeah. to remind people of, of fundamental safety as well. Well, I think we've answered most all the questions. And again, if we didn't get to your question today, remember we will answer them and uh, get back to you with a question there. So let's just thank Michael again for this excellent and just such a kind presentation. I think we all appreciate just your kind words of encouragement today. So thank everyone for attending today. Remember, join us Tuesday, April 21st at noon Eastern time for best practices to service facilities for COVID-19. I hope to see everyone there. And Michael, did you have any closing words? No, everybody stay safe. Um, you are magic. Um, you are amazing, but you're not magic, so be careful. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.